Fox, and welcome to episode 41 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics blog. It is my distinct pleasure to have John Champion with me today. John is one of the two co-hosts of what I think is the greatest podcast in the history of the world ever. Ah, uh, ah, I bet you say that to everybody. I do. <laughs> uh, the Mission Log, and the Mission Log goes through... Uh, the episode, all of the Star Trek episodes. And I met John at a conference, in a social media conference, NMX, in Las Vegas earlier this year and heard him, uh, overheard him talking about his podcast uh, with another uh, person. And I asked him if uh, I could get him to come on the show and talk about all things Star Trek. But specifically, I wanted to voc- uh, focus on leadership. And um, he has just finished... Uh, a uh, the first uh, the original series all seventy nine episodes a podcast on each one and he's doing a wrap up now where they sum up sort of their favorite episodes not so favorite episodes episodes that they're going to consider later on episodes <laughs> they're giving a pass to characters nice. um, so I thought I would uh, visit with him about some of the leadership issues we might draw from the original series so obviously we'll focus on Captain Kirk but also uh, Christopher Pike who appeared in the pilot episode and then an episode that was split into two later called The Menagerie. So mm-hmm. with that very long-winded introduction, John, uh, I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to have you on, on my podcast. I love your podcast. And uh, can you tell me how did this, uh, what was the genesis of this and how did you guys come up with it? Uh, well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and it was great to meet you and everybody at NMX. Um, I hope I get to do that again next year. Um, Mission Log was the brainchild, is the brainchild of Rod Roddenberry. He is the son of Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek. So um, Rod and I had been friends kind of peripherally for a few years. And uh, when I moved to Los Angeles in 2010, he and I got to know each other a little better. And um, at one point, to make what could be a very long, convoluted story very short, uh, he had the idea of watching all of Star Trek, just as like a movie night. He said, you know, I I don't think I've ever sat down and just watched everything in order. We should do that. And I said, that's a great idea. And he said, we should do that, but we should talk about it. And when I say we, I mean you. (laughs) So why don't we create a podcast? And I've got a great idea of who should be uh, the other host. That should be Ken Ray, who does Mac OS Ken, which is a fabulous podcast for people who are Mac aficionados uh, like myself. So he hooked us up, and then Rod became the executive producer to sort of chart the course of what the show would be about, what the format would be like, what the tone would be like. Um, and then he chimes in with us. Uh, we've actually had him on the show for interviews, but he will send us notes. He will actively watch the show and then talk to us before we record about his thoughts. Um, so it's been a great relationship. You know, the three of us get along great and we love to talk about Star Trek and it's been a a pretty interesting journey. It took us a little over a year, about a year and a half to do all of the original series then we move into the animated, then we move into the first six movies, then we do all of the other series, so Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, Enterprise, and that'll be a very long time from now that we're done. I think in in NMX, I heard you estimate it was sometime in the 2020s. Yeah, 2026 is what uh, some of our listeners came up with. Uh, They calculated it all. They said, okay, if you do one episode a week, and here's what you accomplish in that episode, and there are this many episodes of Star Trek. It's something like 735 TV hours, somewhere around there. I might be off by a little bit. Uh, they said, you'll wrap up in about 14 years, and we started in August of 2012. Well, it's been great to, to listen to it and to, and to hear you, you, you all's insights. Um, but with that, let's, uh, let's turn to uh, Captain Kirk, Jim Kirk. Uh, captain yeah. of the original Star Trek. Um, lots of interesting interpretations about his leadership. Of course, you talk about the writing and his acting and the directing and all of that. Nevertheless, there there is a Kirk personality that comes out. And uh, I, I'm probably one of the folks who believes that uh, it was really the, the trilogy of Kirk, Bones, and McCoy that, that helped make the show work. 
Um, but uh, what were your uh, what are your observations on Kirk's leadership style? Well, here's the interesting thing. Um, it, it's very hard, I think, for an audience nowadays to separate William Shatner from Captain Kirk. Um, first of all, because he so inhabited that role and he made that role so much bigger than life. But now William Shatner has this sort of presence in pop culture that goes beyond Captain Kirk even. So one of the great things for me going back and rewatching Star Trek was trying to parse and pick apart Captain Kirk just as the character that we see on screen. What are his decisions like? Where does he get it right? Where does he get it wrong? And I think there are a number of sort of leadership uh, uh, principles you can get from him. And I think the most important is his reliance on the people around him. So for as strong a figure as he is and as decisive a figure as he is, you hit it already, Tom. You said that it's the, the triumvirate of Kirk, McCoy, and Spock. And these represent the different parts of the psyche of leadership. You know, um, we've talked on Mission Log about ethos, pathos, logos as being this uh, the, the Greek idea of persuasion, whether it's through authority, uh, through uh, compassion or through logic. And all three of those characters have their strengths, Kirk, Spock and McCoy. Kirk ultimately has to be the decision maker. But he relies so heavily on the input from Spock to tell him, well, here's what logic dictates you should do. Here's the, the scientific answer to what you should do. And then you have McCoy chiming in saying, here's the human cost of what you need to do or, or what your decision will ultimately uh, render. And then Kirk is one who has to decide, well, what way do I go? And is there a compromise, a satisfactory compromise for all of these competing ideas. There are many episodes of Star Trek where you see Captain Kirk leave the bridge and leave command of the ship to someone else. You know, And obviously it's a matter of getting the character off the bridge so you can get him into action, but there are many times that he's told, he tells Uhura, you know, we, we look at Uhura as kind of a very secondary character. There's an episode where he tells Uhura, you are critical. You're the only one who can do this. And I think it's important for anybody to hear their leader to tell them that, to, to encourage them and remind them of why they're there and the job it is that they are doing. Um, all that said, Kirk gets it wrong every now and then. <laughs> he really does. Um, Captain Kirk is a character that leads from his gut very often, even though he will get advice from others, ultimately it, it, it very often will come down to a decision of, well, I, I just have to make a decision. What feels right? What is the gut telling me I have to do? And there are episodes where Ken and I have disagreed about the outcome of Kirk's decision. Um, Kirk will impose his idea of what freedom means, um, particularly on uh, on cultures that maybe are not as developed or have developed in a different way from our own. Um, and that's a very tricky position to be in because on one level you may be pulling for Kirk and saying, yeah, give these people freedom. But then you look at it another way and you say, this is the only life these people have ever known. And we might be doing more harm than good by going in and changing it based on our perspective and our perspective alone. Is that your perspective on a private little war, I think? was mm. Well, so. more, more particularly the apple. Uh, the, the, the apple has a, a race of people who worship uh, essentially a machine god, a computerized god. And that god provides everything these people need. They, they live forever, almost. They, they have perfect health. They have a beautiful location. They have all the food they need. They have shelter. All they know is the worship of this computer god, which seems kind of benevolent in some way. Um, and then Kirk comes in and destroys that god. Well, you can make the argument that they were worshiping a machine, and there, there is a, a falsity to that. But we also have to be concerned now that these people know no other way of life. 
So we hope that Kirk was responsible enough for the aftermath to leave somebody behind to help them. <laughs> right. yeah. um, one of the things that uh, in uh, – I suppose I didn't really introduce myself, but I uh, am a lawyer and generally deal with compliance and ethics. Uh, the compliance with, is with anti-corruption laws, so that's where the ethical component comes in. And, of course, the, the biggest ethical component of Star Trek is the prime directive. Yeah. And uh, sometimes Kirk seems to get very close to the line, if not kicking dust up on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Spock and Mac I guess McCoy is, is one of the most... Uh, Verifus, Verifus, uh, Ver uh speaks the most about mm -hmm. uh, obeying the prime directive. Uh, but what uh, what do you see when you what do you observe when you see Kirk in the prime directive? You know, it's interesting. The prime directive only came up a few times, and then by by the time you get to the end of the series, it, they really never talk about it again. <laughs> you know, uh, but you mentioned a private little war, and that's the episode where Kirk reveals that he had a hand in shaping the Prime Directive. So, in a private little war, they're on a planet where the Klingons are supplying one faction with weapons, which would allow them then to destroy the other faction on that planet and basically establish a puppet government for the Klingons. Well, this is bad for the Federation. This is bad for the good guys. This is empire expansion uh, from, from our point of view, from the good guys' point of view. Um, and... Kirk says, I was on this planet 13 years ago. These were peaceful people, uh, mostly an agricultural society, and I was basically here incognito. I was here to observe and do nothing else. And now the Klingons have come in and started supplying weapons. They've turned this into a political football between the, the Federation and the Klingon Empire. And now I'm stuck in this place where... I'm the one who basically set the rules saying we can't go in and interfere, but now somebody else has come in and, and is interfering. How then do we step up our interference to fix this problem, if, if there's even a solution? One of the things that I love about the episode is there's really not a good solution to the situation they find themselves in. Um, but how do we also stay true to our ethics to our uh, our adherence upon and reliance on the uh, the prime directive, there are a lot of instances where Kirk has, like you said, come very close to that line. The apple that I mentioned before is a good example of that, where you kind of justify it because the computer god, the machine, would have destroyed the Enterprise. So there is a self-preservation method in there that kicks into overdrive when you can't only rely on the prime directive. We get a little bit of lip service about it, but then, like I said, they sort of drop it. Right. <laughs> and the prime directive essentially means non-interference. And that's all. Just don't interfere. Um, I guess unless you have to. <laughs> and then sometimes you have to. Right. Uh, in my world, we would say that as the risks increase, you have to manage that risk more closely. And I guess in the Star Trek world, as uh, we get closer to the problems increase, you get closer and closer to the line of the prime directive. And uh, I really thought they stepped over the line in the Apple yeah. um, in a private little war. I, I didn't think he stepped over the line, but boy, he was perilously close. Yeah, that, that, that's such an interesting episode because he and McCoy get to have that argument to which there is not a right answer. And, and they leave there thinking, well, this is only going to get worse. And that, that's a realistic problem to face. And probably the one episode that bothered me the most and has bothered me the most over the years was the Apple. <laughs> uh, after uh, after the, the villagers are taught how to smash a head, uh, yeah. I think Bone says, and Jim, now they've learned to kill. Yeah, and yeah, which they crazy. never needed to before. Right, yeah. right. Um, let's turn now to, uh, if we could for a few moments, to Christopher Pike. Yeah. And uh, the thing that you guys certainly talk about when you talk about Pike, and uh, I guess maybe for those who don't know, Christopher Pike was the original captain of the original Enterprise and the original pilot. And uh, they ended up going back and making a second pilot, but the uh, quality of the first pilot was so good, they ended up splitting that up and making a two-part uh, episode called The Menagerie that they uh, released as part of the original 79, but... Uh, Jeffrey Hunter, I think, uh, played Christopher Pike in the original pilot. 
And what struck me was, uh, and you guys talk about this, his world weariness. Yeah. Um, and that's something we don't see from Kirk. Uh, a grizzled veteran, uh, as I recall in uh, the cage, he had just come out of a major engagement or some type of military fight where he had had to uh, basically choose who lived and died by selecting uh, men to fight. And that really preyed upon him. Yeah. What did you guys uh, see in that? Boy, that that's such a good scene, and I encourage people who have not seen The Cage uh, to watch it. Um, you know, that show was rejected by NBC because it was too intellectual. <laughs> and they realized, uh, Gene Roddenberry realized when we went back to remake Star Trek to create a second pilot, totally unheard of in TV production, that he had to amp up the uh, the, the action. But they also changed the character of the captain. Kirk is, like I said, he leads with his gut, and he's very energetic, and he's always the first to throw himself in into harm's way. Jeffrey Hunter's portrayal of Pike is, um, it, it is very different, that, that world weariness when he's having this discussion with his doctor. Um, and it's a great scene. Dr. Boyce, this is before Dr. McCoy, comes into the captain's quarters and he, he unpacks this medical kit that's actually uh, a little bar. He's got a decanter in there with some bourbon, I think. And he says to the captain, some men will tell their bartender things they won't tell their doctor. Right. And they get to have this personal conversation about the the weight that is upon Pike um, from losing his crew members. We see that a little bit with Kirk but not enough as the series goes on. Uh, Balance of Terror, we get to see Kirk shaken by the death of a crew member, but we don't see a lot of that later. Um, the thing about Pike is that, like Kirk, we see him appropriately relying on the people around him. He's got a great crew. He's got Spock. He's got number one. A uh, strong female character on the bridge, who unfortunately we did not get in the later series. Uh, we have Dr. Boyce, who, like I said, is that that personal compatriot, uh, somebody he can unload to about his personal uh, struggles. And throughout the course of the episode, what happens when, when Pike is incarcerated by these aliens, basically to be put on display in a zoo... Um, he realizes that this is a terrible alternative as well. <laughs> that to him, there's more value in the freedom that carries with it these extreme risks than being in the gilded cage that the Tolosians have created for him, um, in which he wouldn't have to struggle. He, he can actually, in his mind, and, and in this construct created by the aliens, go back to Earth enjoy a pleasant life. His horse is there. He's on a picnic with a beautiful woman. It seems like everything is perfect, but he realizes that it isn't real. So he does everything he can to get out of that and back to where he belongs, which is on the Enterprise, even though that brings with it some struggle, some pain in his future. Right. Um, let me go back to one thing that you started with when I asked you about Kirk's leadership, which was you talked about the trust he has uh, in the people around him. Um, as a, as a, I guess, elementary and then early teen, one of the things that bothered me about Star Trek was that the captain always put himself in danger. And my father had been a <laughs> naval officer in World War II in Korea. And I asked him at one time, I said, Dad, why on earth would the captain go ashore? Uh, uh, what happens if the captain dies? And he said, well, that's just a, a style of leadership, and it may create risk, but it's, it's an acceptable style, and some captains are like that. But then he pointed out the flip side was if Kirk's on shore or on a planet, he has left a relatively junior officer in charge of the Enterprise, and that there is a trust level there. Uh, have you, do you guys see any of that or any observations on that? Yeah, and I, I think that's brilliantly said. You know, uh, there are Star Trek got to a point where it relied too much on just sending Kirk, Spock, and McCoy away um, because they were the three stars of the show. But there are many other episodes that you can point to. Um, let's say the Doomsday Machine, yes, where Kirk allows himself to stay on the constellation. Spock is back on the Enterprise. Scotty is back on the Enterprise. Um, 
because Kirk has to solve the problem, but he's not about to leave everybody who is a senior officer in danger as well. The ship is still more important, and the lives of the 400-plus other people are still more important. So even if it got out of hand, and obviously we correct that by the time we get to Next Generation, where the captain is yes. not allowed the majority of the time off the ship, um, Kirk makes... I, I think Kirk uh, improves his leadership by understanding and participating in what the situation is. There are some times that he can't help it. There are some times that he is taken away by whatever the alien forces that they've encountered. Um, but you can, for the most part, you can trust Spock to be in command. There are a few episodes where he's not very good in a command situation. Certainly Scotty. You know, his uh, his primary concern is the health of the ship. Right. So if the ship is running OK, he can get those people out of there and get them to safety. Um, so it's mostly well thought out in that respect. Um, we haven't gotten to a point where you've you've ticked down the number of senior officers. So you're left with, you know, the, the cook in the command chair. <laughs> right. Um, that was uh your observation on the difference in command styles between the original series and TNG, that was one of two things that struck me about the difference. The other one you guys mentioned, and I think, um, I can't remember the number of the episode, but it's it's the colors. The difference mm. in the vibrancy of colors from the original <laughs> series to TNG, I had the exact same feeling. I would watch those colors, and I just thought they were dull, dull, dull. And I'd go back and watch uh, the original series, and I'm like, wow. What did they do in the 60s that was so different than the 80s? Yeah, yeah, that, that style for some reason, and it's really come back, you know, that, that 60s aesthetic really works somehow. And in the 80s, to me, it just looked like a Hilton hotel. Um, and I agree, it might have been a very comfortable ship, and, and you would want for nothing. But boy, would I get bored with that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, but then the flip side is uh, if you're under Kirk, you might feel like your life is in danger very often. <laughs> you know? Right. There's one other thing that I'll say about Kirk, though, um, that, that we didn't talk too much about, and, and that is his – and Picard does it too, but, but we see it very acutely in Kirk in a few episodes, which is his pressure on, on his crew – to make absolutely sure that they live up to the ideals that they and Starfleet set for themselves. Um, we talk a lot on Mission Log about the Corbomite maneuver. Right. Um, and when you get to the end of that episode, you have the junior crewman who is scared to death because he thought that they were just about to get destroyed. And now they have to go help the alien who almost destroyed them. And Kirk says, no, you have to go. You have to go because that's what we do. We help others, and that is our ideal that we set for ourselves, is that we're better than being reactionary. We're better than being being violent. So I will risk putting us in danger if it means that we get to live up to that ideal to help others when they're in need. And you see that throughout Star Trek when Star Trek is very good. You see that all the time. Um, but that's one of the, the standout episodes for that kind of leadership. Uh, John, we're near the end of our time, and I think probably my viewers would shoot me if I at least didn't ask, if I could ask, what are some <laughs> of your favorite episodes? Uh, well, I, I mentioned that one, the Corbin White Maneuver, for sure, because, wow, it, it really has a great moral message at the end about living up to the ideal that you set for yourself. Be the person that you say that you are. Um, and, and I think that's a really important one. Um, we had a bit of a discussion about uh, sitting on the edge of forever when we got to our wrap up. And I'll maintain that it is a, a beautifully told love story, which explores the characters of Kirk, Spock and McCoy. When you go back to that leadership thing about um, logic versus emotion, um, even if it isn't, a great example of what Star Trek is necessarily about. So I, I hold that one up there for sure. Um, boy, there's so many. Uh, Where No Man Has Gone Before, the second pilot, I right. think is just terrific. Uh, what about you? Well, I have to say that uh, far and beyond, it's um, City on the Edge of Forever. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it's science fiction at its finest. I'm a historian by training, so I love the idea of the circular nature or even the river of history. And right. to see a Joan Collins from the 60s is just a treat. Oh, stunning. <laughs> stunning. 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 Stunning, yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah. The immunity syndrome, uh, I've heard you guys hmm. talk about. Uh, that it, I find to be one of the most in- intriguing to me that we would be uh, parasites in an organism the size of the universe. Yeah, and we would be the parasites. Uh, that's that's another one that I really liked. Um, the Corvite maneuver was excellent, um, and then uh, I have to say uh, the trouble with tribbles. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, have to go with that one. Star Trek is that rare show that started out firing on all cylinders, and it it just got better and better throughout that first season. Right. There are a couple of clunkers. Every show is allowed that. But that first season is so sharp and so smart um, that it's strange that by the time they got to the third season, which is a very short time in TV history time, uh, that it would get worse and worse. (laughs) Now, there are great episodes in season three. Um, Ken and I were both very happy at re-watching Let That Be Our Last Battlefield, uh, where you have the half-black, half-white Sharon and Beale. Um, And that episode is so heavy-handed, and it's so obvious, but I think it's brilliant in how obvious and heavy-handed it is. There are not a lot of shows that can get away with that, and Star Trek does, and it becomes a point of advocacy. Um, one of the other things that I'll mention since we are talking about leadership is that Rod, Rod and Barry and I have this conversation very often about Star Trek as being a show that questions authority. So even though there is an authoritarian streak in Star Trek, they are in a quasi-military structure, and Kirk is a very strong leader – there is this idea about questioning leadership, questioning the things that are just handed down to you by rote. So one of my favorite episodes in that respect is Who Mourns for Adonais? Right. Because it, it questions man's relationship to God. And I think that's so uh, profound and, and smart and important for an audience to see and wrestle with those ideas. So I'll, I, I'll definitely throw that one in, too. The... Uh, uh as a Southerner growing up in the 60s, uh-huh. that particular episode with the black and white actually spoke directly to me. Oh, wow. So uh, I had a different, because I came from a different angle, it had a different uh, side to me. And who mourns? Um, it's, it's also interesting that um, the questioning of authority, uh, in my mind, uh, questioning God is completely separate from questioning of authority. Mm. You could call that questioning God. And mm-hmm. so I see that throughout the um, the entire series, where if you'd asked me or said to me, uh, what about uh, the episodes where they question authority? That that word doesn't mean the same thing to me. So it's interesting, interesting. Our, because yeah, of yeah. our backgrounds and the interpretation. Uh, cool. John, I cannot tell you how much fun this has been for me. I have enjoyed every minute of it, uh, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, if people wanted to listen to your podcast, can you tell them where they might go? Sure. Um, go to missionlogpodcast.com. Uh, the show is available everywhere. It's available on iTunes. It's available through Libsyn, through Stitcher. But the best way to get the show, because all the information is there, is missionlogpodcast.com. And if anyone wanted to email you uh, for follow-up, could they uh, do so? If so, how? Absolutely. Uh, look for us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash mission log pod. I'm very active there, responding to people's questions, responding to emails. You can email us directly, email the show directly, mission log at roddenberry.com. And Tom, thank you again, man. I, I love talking about Star Trek. This is, this is a great gig. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Well, you've just informed the legal compliance world. So thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. This is Tom Fox, and uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll look forward to hearing you or seeing you on our next episode. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed Episode 41 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. If you'd like more information, you can contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Thanks very much, and we look forward to visiting with you again on the next podcast.